we can start this presentation without our expert. Let me introduce you our expert. He is Rob Trickle. He is the head of North Carolina Forest Services statewide forest health program. He loves to share his passion for nature with others. And he told me that when he grows up, he wants to be a kid. So hello, Rob, how are you today? Doing wonderful, outstanding. Okay, so Great. thank you very much for being with us today. And now is your time, so take it away. All right, thank you. And I wanna make sure I get the right one, there you go. You, you, see my, you see my presentation, right? Yes, perfect. <laughs> All right, so uh, like you said, I'm, I'm Rob Trickle. We're gonna talk about being on the lookout for some of the most unwanted trees that affect our forest. Um, before I get too far into the, uh, the trees that we're gonna go into, I wanted to share one thing. Uh, being in forest health and dealing with forest health, uh, we deal with a lot of different things that affect our forest. A lot of things that are, try to you know, hurt our trees or kill our trees. And so some of them are, are biotic, or in other words, they, uh, hold on a second. They're, they're biotic, or in other words, they're, they're living things, and others are abiotic, or, or which means that they, they are not living. And on the abiotic side, you have anything that's related to weather, injuries, toxins, uh, soils, and on the biotic, it's all the way from plants to uh, micro, microorganisms or, or pathogens, insects, and diseases. And so we deal with, with all these different things. Now, today we're gonna to be dealing mainly with the, the insect side. Uh, I also deal with the, the, the pathogen side uh, in my job. And so the, the, the one thing that uh, I do wanna get across is a lot of times when, with, with the native insects and diseases or native insects and pathogens, uh, the trees have been living with them for a long time, and they, the, sometimes the trees win and sometimes the pathogens win, but they, uh, the, the trees learn to protect themselves and the pathogens find new ways to get in and they, uh, they go round and round. But uh, so basically uh, th what will happen sometimes is that trees will get out of, uh, something will get out of, of uh, balance. When, uh, because of weather or because of injuries or something wrong with the soil or whatever. And the, the, the trees become weakened or they, they become stressed. And that's when we get these calls most of the time. Most of the insects and diseases we deal with are secondary. In other words, they can't attack the trees unless the trees are already uh, weakened by something else. So the, the what I'm gonna go over today are some invasive species. These are non-native, they came from another country. Our trees are naive when these things come in. They don't know how to protect themselves from those trees. They come here without their natural enemies. And so a, a lot of times these will, will go unchecked and they'll, they'll, uh, they, they will stress our trees and, and kill our trees in different ways. So the five I'm gonna go over are emerald ash borer, spotted lanternfly, gypsy moth, Asian longhorn beetle and red bay, red bay ambrosia beetle. Uh, each of them works in a slightly different way, and they, but they all affect our trees. And these are, there, there are a lot more unwanted pests, but these are the ones that we're dealing with or, or will be dealing with soon. So I'll start out with the Asian longhorn beetle. This is one that is not in North Carolina yet. Uh, it's thought that it stowed away. And I'm not gonna read everything on this thing. I'm gonna, um, I got more on here. I had a professor in college who, uh, who put more on the board than what she taught, but she expected you to read the rest of it so, because it was gonna be part of the test. So anyway, uh, it, it was thought to have stored, stowed away in either crates or pallets and, uh, and it found its way shipped over to the to United States uh, probably in the mid nineties. It, it is a uh, pest that does uh, attack hardwoods. So your maples, ash, elm, uh, poplars, mimosa, it's a whole large, uh, a uh, number of different species that this this uh, this pest will attack. <clears throat> yeah, it's the, so those are the victims. The MO or modus operandi or the mode of operation. The way these trees 
uh, uh, the, the way these pests affect our trees is with this one, it bores into the tree and it damages the living tissue under the wood, under the bark, the, the wood, the sapwood and all. And um, it, it, that affects the, the vascular system in the tree, the, 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 uh, the parts of the tree that move water up and down, uh, water up the tree. And so it'll result in uh, the tree dying back, declining and eventually dying. <clears throat> so what uh, the description of it, it's a glossy black, you can see it over here on the wanted poster, it's a, a, a glossy black uh, large beetle. It's three quarters of an inch to uh, an inch and a half long, uh, has a lot of white dots on it. You'll also notice the antennas are very long. Uh, it's not really long horned, it's got long antennas, uh, but it, uh, the, the antennas are very long and they have these white bands in each segment. Uh, the larvae, which you see on this side over here, are white. The larvae here, uh, it, it's white. They can be up to about two and a half inches long. They're pretty big. Uh, it, and they're the part that does the damage. They bore into the tree and, and, uh, and tear up the wood. Um, what we're going to look for, though, uh, sometimes you're not going to see these. So when you don't see those, sometimes you'll see sawdust under the tree. You'll see uh, egg niches, like right here. This is a place where the, the female came and chewed a hole in the bark and uh, laid, laid her egg there. The, uh, the larva will, uh, will hatch, bore into the tree, and, and start the damage from there. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, exit holes like right here. Uh, they're almost perfectly round and they're about, if, if you took a pencil, you could just about, I mean, you, you could put a, a pencil eraser in that hole and it would, it, it would just barely fit. So that's the size hole you're looking for uh, to, to give you a good idea whether it is the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, sometimes you'll see sap weeping from the tree from where the boring took place. Uh, you'll see some early leaf color, which is a sign of stress. You'll see some dieback, which usually when you see things dry, dying back from the top, it's because they, uh, it's because the, the vascular system or the water, the, the, the plumbing system in the tree has been uh, disrupted and the water is not getting all the way to, from the roots to the top of the tree. So you'll see it slowly dying back from the top. The, the tree will eventually uh, decline and die. This is not doing what it's supposed to. Let me go here. Okay, so where is it? Uh, it, it has been found in several places in the United States since, like I said, it came in in the 90s. I think it was first found in, in the Illinois area, in, in the Chicago area. Uh, and as you can see, the, the, white, uh, the, the white squares here are ones that have been eradicated. So it's been eradicated in Illinois, one place in Ontario, and in New Jersey. Uh, at the same time, there were some other... Um, there, there were some other sites that are going on right now. They have not been uh, eradicated yet, but there's one in Ohio, uh, one in New York. The one in New York has probably been going the longest and it, uh, they're, they're kind of playing whack-a-mole with it right now. They, they seem to think they, they've got it under control and it pops up somewhere else. Uh, that's been going on since about 1996. Uh, Massachusetts has been dealing with it for since 2008. Uh, and this was the first place where it was not just in urban areas, but it was in the in the a forested area. I, I believe they're getting making that box for that a little bit smaller and smaller, uh, and they're they're hoping to uh, to have success uh, get getting rid of it here soon. Uh, but if you look down at the bottom there, you'll see that it's it it has been found in in South Carolina. It was found there a couple months ago, down near Charleston. And they're still doing surveys down there to find out how bad it is, uh, to to see um, what resources are going to need they're going to need to get rid of it. Um, what it will. Um, so what w w some something that we can do about it. Uh, what one is we we want to prevent the movement of firewood. If you go, if I go back to the last slide, you'll see up here this wood. If that tree was killed by Asian longhorn beetle, you cut that up into firewood. That's fine. Use it, use it in your, uh, your your own fireplace. Use it close to home. But if you're going to go out to the Smoky Mountains, don't take it with you because you may be taking what killed that tree with you to the mountains. So moving, don't move firewood is very important with this one. It does move in firewood in uh, uh, in several life stages. Um, 
In those areas that, that I showed you where the, the eradication efforts are going on, they have to remove and destroy every affected tree and a buffer of trees nearby. So uh, it's not very popular when you go on someone's property and take their trees off, but that's what they have to do because uh, this, this is a very difficult tree to, a difficult pest to control. There are some insecticides you could use. And uh, I think the Ohio, the Ohio site, they were trying, rather than cutting everybody's trees down, they were trying insecticides and it, they got a little bit of a slow start on that. So uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the one tried and true way though is to remove and destroy the affected trees and everything around it. Uh, if you happen to spot one, uh, collect a sample if you can and put it in a jar. If you can only put it in a bag, put the bag in the freezer as quickly as you can. Take a picture of it to help confirm it and then send it to uh, this, this, uh, uh, this website new pe or this uh, email address, newpest at ncagr.gov. And that will go to the uh, plant industry division of the Department of Agriculture. They are the, uh, the agency that's in charge of, uh, of, of quarantines and regulatory aspects of uh, uh, some pests. So um, anyway, get, get a hold of, uh, get, get a good picture and send it to them. Uh, best picture you can take of it. Also include the location and the date. Uh, they'll, hold of the, the, you know, they'll, they'll investigate and let you know what's going on. Um, with any of these pests as I go along, if you think it might be it, go ahead and send uh, a report in. I would, um, I just got a call the other, uh, last week with somebody thinking that they had this and it turned out to be something else, but I would really rather call back and say, hey, good news, it's not emerald ash borer. Then you think, well, I'm not really sure and not send it in, no, send it in. We'll, 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 we'll deal with it and we don't get mad when people send us a false report. Uh, I did throw this picture of this woman in here, uh, Linda Bach from Worcester, uh, Massachusetts. And I, I put that in just to show she, she saw an insect in her yard that she had never seen before. Actually, she saw it on the news about a, a couple months later when she was in New York. And so she saw this thing in, in her, in her uh, trees and thought, hey, that, that, might be, that might be something. I've heard of other people who found it and didn't know what it was at all, and they just collected it and took it to an entomologist. But the, the reality with this is we, we do a lot of surveying, we do a lot of trapping, we do a lot of monitoring for different pests. And this is one pest that will get, will get your attention because that insect is pretty big. It'll, it'll get your attention real fast. And uh, people wonder what it is. And so it's been citizens just finding it in their yard or finding it in their trees that have been the, uh, have found most of them so far. Hey Rob. Yes, sir. I have a question. So if we found on our, on our yard a tree with these holes and we, and we suspect that is a ALB and we send and they said, yes, it is. Why do they have to cut the trees around that tree if they don't have the holes? Um, well, the hole is actually an exit hole. So the insect has already gone into that tree. It has done the damage it's going to do and it has come back out. And when it comes back out, it's going to go to the next tree. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the good thing with this is they don't, they don't take off and fly miles to the next tree. They're going to go to the next tree that is a, a potential host. Uh, so it, it, they do, I, I don't know what the buffer zone around a, 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 a tree is, but they, they do have to take out a certain number because if there's exit holes in there, it's, it's gone to the next tree. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions on uh, Asian no, longhorn I beetle? Put, I put the link on the chat, so for people just to copy and paste. Okay. It's better just to send a picture and come back and say, okay, that you are fine, than uh, to have it on your yard and not say anything. That's correct. Thank you. All right, I'm going to send another one here that is not found in North Carolina. We don't think. Uh, there are some surveys and trapping efforts going on right now, uh, but this is called the spotted, spotted lanternfly. <clears throat> it's thought to have come into North Carolina, hitching a ride on uh, 
not on wood products, but on stone or tile products. And I'll explain how that might have happened in a little bit. Uh, the, the victims, the, the hosts that it, uh, it affects, there's, there's been about seven, uh, more than 70 species of woody plants identified so far. Uh, it does prefer the tree of heaven, which is also called Alanthus, uh, which is a good thing uh, because uh, Alanthus is a, a non-native invasive itself. But uh, uh, it does pr seem to prefer tree of heaven and there are some studies going on right now to see if it requires tree of heaven as part of its life cycle. But it, it does seem to be attracted to the tree of heaven. Uh, the way that it affects the trees, it, it, has, uh, it is a leaf hopper. And uh, it, it, so it has a piercing sucking mouth part. And so it will, what it does, it will attack to a, attach to a tree. It'll uh, uh, poke its, uh, that piercing sucking, that piercing part of its mouth part into the tree and start sucking the sap or the water out of that tree. The, uh, and uh, if, if it does enough, then it, if it takes enough of the sap out, it's gonna affect the health of that tree. So you can see down there a partial list of the hosts. Some of the more, uh, so, some of the ones that they know of are apples, birch, cherry, grapes, hops, lilac, maple, poplar, stone fruits, tree of heaven, walnut, willow. And like I said, there's about 70 different species that these will go after. The descriptions, it's, it is for disguise. It has a, a lot of, it's, 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 every part of its lifestyle is pretty interesting. The adult looks like a colorful moth, but it's not a moth, and it's called spotted lanternfly, and it's not a fly. It, it is a leafhopper, and, and that's uh, the, this, uh, the, the picture of it here with its wings folded up looks more like a leafhopper with, uh, uh, with the way it folds up its wings over its back. Uh, these moths are pretty big. They're like an inch, and almost up to two inches across. across. Uh, they do lay these egg masses, which look like a it's like somebody spit on the side of the tree, really, but it's a big old glob of glob. Uh, and it, it, it'll lay this not only on a tree, but on any flat surface. We'll go over that in just a minute. Uh, the, the, it, uh, from the, when the eggs hatch, and there could be anywhere from 25 to 50 eggs in one of these egg masses. Uh, the eggs come, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the insect hatches as nymphs. So it'll go fourth stages as nymphs. The first ones are black. With, with white dots on them. And then as, as they, they get into their fourth, uh, fourth stage, they're, they're red with, with white stars on them. Uh, what we're gonna be looking for, uh, we're mainly gonna be looking for the insect itself. Uh, the adults are what we're gonna see right now. We might see some late season nymphs, but the adults are what we'd be looking for now. And, and soon we'll be looking for the egg masses on the trees. And uh, right now, most of our surveys are, are going on in areas where there's either uh, uh, grapes, grapes growing, or you know, wineries, uh, vineyards, or in areas along railroad tracks. Those are notorious for having a lot of alanthus, or just areas where we, we know where there's alanthus. Uh, but anyway, right now, adults and nymphs. Pretty soon, it'll be egg masses. Then uh, that would be the late season, or the red, the red, uh, the red one there. Uh, all of these have lots of spots on them. Uh, so, uh, it, so if you see something that doesn't have the spot, it's that might not be it, but these do have spots all over them in, in all life stages except for the egg mass. Uh, the other thing we're going to look for is honeydew. And honeydew is, there's no better way to say it than, than uh, with a leaf hopper, any tree with a piercing sucking mouth part, they will, you know, they, they, they put the straw in the, in the tree, they pull the sap out. What they don't, their body doesn't use, they eject it out the other end. So it's, it's basically liquid insect poop. Uh, it, it is sweet because the tree has, you know, the sap has sugars in it, and uh, it, it's a, a, it's it's a good medium for growing sooty mold, which is like a mildew that will grow on top. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. So where is it right now? It's um, it well, it was first found up in Pennsylvania, up in this area of Pennsylvania, and. Uh, it since has moved out. It was found in 2014, so in the last six years, it's spread across Pennsylvania. It's gone into New Jersey, um, Delaware, Maryland. Uh, about two years ago, it was found in Virginia, Frederick County, Virginia, and uh, it's since moved from there up into West Virginia. So it, it's, it's moving kind of quickly. 
uh, they they're they're trying to do some controls on it right right yet. It's it's very difficult to to do anything to keep it under control. But it um, you are also going to see these little red dots all over the place, including one in in uh, in Asheville actually in Buncombe County. So it was found once in North Carolina, but where you see these red dots here, uh, spotted line, spotted lanternfly was found, but they they found no infestation in the area. So in, in, for instance, where they found it in, uh, in, in Asheville, uh, there was a guy with a shop who had gotten some art supplies from a place in Pennsylvania. And when he opened the box, there was a, a dead adult uh, spotted lanternfly in the box. So he, he picked it up. He knew there was something wrong with it. This is an odd one. So he, he called the right people plant industry went out, they had their entomologist go out, take a look at it, and it was spotted lanternfly, but it was, it, there, there was no need to do any action because there was, there was no infestation in the area, it's just one dead, dead uh, beetle. I would hope that all these stories up here are about the same. Uh, they just, they, they found the insect, but they haven't found where it's gotten into the trees yet. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, um, ba uh, more than a, a it, it does affect tree health. It will kill some plants. Uh, more than that, it's a nuisance. It's a horrible nuisance. And what I talked about earlier with that sooty mold, with the uh, the, the uh, with, with the uh, gosh. The honeydew dropping off the tree, it will feel like it's raining underneath this tree. If, you, if you're out in the middle of the sun, sunny day underneath a, a tree that has these in it, uh, if, if it feels like it's raining under the tree, you, you might look up, see if, if it's this or one of the other leaf hoppers, or it could be aphids or, uh, or scale also. But in, in this case, it really feels like there's a good rainstorm going. This is splatter marks from the, uh, from, from the honeydew itself on, a, a, on pavement. And then the, all this dark right here is the, the sooty mold or the mildew-like fungus that has grown uh, that has grown on that uh, uh, you know that has grown on that uh, honeydew as it came down. Melody said on the chat that that looks awful. It it it, it for the people that are there it's it's hideous. They they come back and they're they're it, the people that I know of has come back from that. They're like this is life changing. This 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 is ugly, you know. And, and like a, a tree that was in a parking lot next to a uh, a supermarket had these things probably about this density right here all over the sidewalk. Wow. And uh, and and as you're walking, these things are they're they're leaf hoppers. They they. Uh, they can fly, but they don't fly that much, but they can hop forever. And so you're, you're walking along, you can't even step on them. You know, they, they, they just kind of sp boing, spring out this way, spring out that way. And so, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a nasty mess. I've also, if you go on YouTube and you, uh, you uh, search for, uh, just put in spotted lanternfly and, uh, uh, We'll just put in spotted lanternfly, and you'll see some places where there's an infestation like this. And every one of this, these is an adult, uh, adult spotted lanternfly. But they uh, showed a guy took his hand and put it up near, put it put it up in this area right here, and then just swept his hand down the side of that tree, and it sounded like glass crystals hitting the ground, just just wow. tinkling the whole way down as these things fell off. It was just it. Oh gosh, you make the hair stand up on the back of your ne uh, neck. I have to check that out later. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but it's really disturbing. So what, what do we do? We're not going to move firewood with these. They, they will, uh, the, these egg masses, like you see up here, uh, these egg masses are, uh, will, they'll, they'll overwinter this way. So you cut up your firewood, you bring it down. Uh, don't move firewood. Uh, they actually say don't move anything that's in your yard without inspecting it first. This thing will get on. Uh, th there's a list of regulated items that you have to have uh, inspected before you say, uh, say, say you're going to move from Pennsylvania. You go up to Pennsylvania to uh, p bring some stuff back from a family. Um, the stuff out in the yard has to be inspected because they could be laying eggs on the picnic table, the lawnmower, the chairs, the side of the house, the, the, your car. If your car's been sitting there long enough, they may be on your tires. 
uh, it could be all over everything. So you really need uh, to, to check any flat surfaces before bringing, uh, bringing it back. So the Rob, um, go, ahead. go ahead. It is easy to spot them because they are always like in a big colony, no? It's not like the L LAB, that they're more like individuals. It is like a big colony. Um, I, I, I haven't seen it directly myself, but they, uh, I, I, I believe that eventually they're going to get in those big colonies, but I, I you know, it, it's, they got to start somewhere. So you won't always, you won't always see them, but if you're in the, uh, in one of those, uh, if, if you're in one of these counties right here, before you leave that blue area, you, you need to make sure it's not on your car. It's not on your, uh, your boat or your, or whatever before you take it out of that area. So actually related with this, Skelly has a question. Will these flies make it down to North Carolina eventually by themselves? Or, or they have to be attached to something like a car? Um, well, I, I, they, if, if they came down naturally, I don't know how far they, they move naturally every year. But it would, I, I think it would take a good while for it to actually find its way down here naturally. Now, they could hop from tree to tree and then go down a railroad track or something like that, or, you know, where, where there's a lot of Atlantis. But your big movement is going to be with, with people not paying attention, not knowing that the, the, the egg masses are on their car and bringing it with them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how they got, that's how they got here too. They were on either tiles or, you know, the... T tiles or, or rock, stones that were brought over from uh, Asia and the Middle East for, you know, for, uh, you know, our, our building, our sidewalks, our bathrooms and all that kind of thing. And they, they think that's what it came across on. Okay. And Jennifer wants to know if they have any natural predator that they can help with these uh, uh, bugs just to have them under control. I don't know that we're at that point. I'm sure that any uh, any that, that there are probably some some birds and some mammals that would uh, that would you know that, that normally eat leaf hoppers may be attracted to these. There's nothing in mass doing that, and it's it's only been here since 2014. So I would say that 90% of the research that's gone on in these things has has been more recently. So. I'm not aware of anything being uh, tested right now. It could be, but it, it's it's really early in the infestation to, to have a, you know widespread uh, some kind of a widespread thing that it could be released for this. Mm -hmm. And Roxanne wants to know: Do they only eat trees, or they eat something else? Uh, as, as far as we know, they are they're they're sap sucking insects. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, you know, they, they do, they're, they're limited on what they could eat because of the, the type of mouth part. And uh, the way a, an insect affects a tree depends on its mouth part. And in this case, it's, it's more like a uh, mosquito or a vampire. You know, it's, 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 it's going in and, it, and it's sucking the juice out of the, the blood out of the tree. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are some insecticides that can be used. Um, that you know, we, so so there are there are some for high value trees, uh, I, like like said, we don't know about the uh, the bio controls. Uh, here again, like the other one, collect a sample if you're able to store it. I mean, this this one is pretty easy. Uh, I don't think you're going to misidentify it. There are many things that look like that. Uh, take pictures and send them to the new pest uh, at ncagr.gov, and let somebody know exactly where it is and. Uh, my experience is they, they will be there the next day. Uh, this, this is one we don't want in North Carolina. We got a lot of wineries. You got the breweries growing hops. Um, they, they, there, there's, there's people who, <laughs> nobody, nobody wants this. And so they want to try to uh, detect it early and, and, and respond, respond quickly. All right, any other questions on uh, spotted lanternfly? Well, um, I was texting uh, Jennifer because uh, she asked uh, if the lantern flies are actually flies, but you said no, that they are tree hoppers. That's correct. They're, they're plant hoppers. They are, they are not actually flies. So they're not flies, but they, they look like moths and they're not moths either. 
So. Okay. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll move on to Gypsy Moth. And Gypsy Moth is uh, kind of here, but kind of not. It is, um, and I'll show you that what I mean in a minute. But this is one that was, uh, uh, th th this, is, this is a criminal here that was smuggled over into the United States on purpose. Uh, there was a guy back in the 1880s who wanted to try, he, he, uh, he, he wanted to try, to try to grow silkworms. And the silkworms we have in the United States just don't reproduce uh, as much as he'd like. So he, he heard about this gypsy moth over in Europe, brought, brought, brought them back to see if he could breed them with ours and produce a lot of silk with, with, uh, with insects that bred pretty fast. Well, they got loose. This is up in Massachusetts. And uh, they, they got loose and they, they seem to like oaks. They like a lot of different hardwoods, but they prefer oaks. So they've been moving uh, down ever since for over 100 years, 100, 120, 140 years now. Uh, and they have gotten to the edge of North Carolina. And uh, I'll show you a little bit more about where they are. But the way this one, um, affects trees is uh, the caterpillars are the, the, the damaging part. They will get on a, they will get on the leaves and right after the trees leaf out in the spring, they used all their energy to put out new leaves. The caterpillar comes along and chews the leaves off, completely denuding the trees. Uh, this, this was a, this is a uh, early summer picture of a, of a forest that, that had been, uh, that had been defoliated or all the leaves had been eaten off of. So it causes two things. Number one, the tree loses some time doing photosynthesis and creating new energy. And it's also going back into its reserves energy and pulling that up to put out another set of leaves. So um, healthy trees can be, can be defoliated or have all its leaves eaten more than once. Um, you know, a couple years in a row, four or five years, the healthier the tree is, the more it can stand this kind of defoliation. But uh, trees that are, that are older or that are weaker, that uh, or don't have the extra reserve, can die uh, very quickly. They'll decline and die uh, with one or two uh, defoliations. So it, 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 does, it, it does take the energy away from a tree and then makes it use its energy again to uh, to, to put out a whole new set of leaves. Um, so the description, the uh, egg masses are, look a lot like the other ones, except for these look more, they're more hairy. They're more like, a, uh, have you ever seen one of the camel, uh, the, the camel hair jackets? It, it kind of reminds me of that. These egg masses though will have about 200, up to 200 uh, eggs inside. Uh, but they look like little globs of camel hair, uh, camel hair jacket. And so, uh, the, the larva, which you see over here, they're in, an inch and a half to two inches long in, in, the, in, the later, in the later stages. And they have rows of blue dots and red dots along the, the back of, the, 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 back of the, uh, the, the larva. Uh, the, uh, the adults are, look like just about any other moth. Uh, the male is a little bit smaller and brownish. He's got the, uh, the, the, the feathery antenna. The uh, female is larger. Now he will fly. Uh, he, he comes out first and he takes off looking for a mate. She'll, uh, the, the, his siblings will come out, uh, female siblings will come out later. They, they cannot fly. They're too heavy. They're so egg laden, they can't fly. So they will stay close to home. And so a male from somewhere else will come and, and mate with her. Uh, and then they'll, they'll lay these, uh, these egg masses here. So um, the, so what, what are we going to look for? At this time of year, we're, we're probably see a few adults, but we're gonna start seeing egg masses here real soon. Um, and this is one thing that when we, we, we think that is in an area we can go out after the leaves are dropped and very easily go out into the woods and look for egg masses. Um, they, uh, when, when they are defoliating the tree, when you walk through the forest, it'll sound like it's raining, but you're getting hit with little pellets. And those are the, uh, uh, that, that's the caterpillar poop there that, that is coming down. You'll, you'll hear a lot of that. It's, it, it'll sound like we're training, but it's actually solid. Uh, the egg masses, we will, uh, the, the, this is the, uh, the part that will be uh, the, where it will overwinter when it's in the egg. 
And this, this is also how it's moved in firewood because they'll lay their eggs just like the uh, spotted lanternfly. They'll, they'll lay it on anything. Um, uh, the trees, the side of the house, the camper, the dog, whatever. It, it'll find lots of things to lay the eggs on. Uh, in the spring, the larva will come out and then the uh, adults come out in the early to midsummer or around from early to midsummer. Well, what we can do about it. Oh, first off, here's what we're, uh, here's where it's located. It started up here and uh, started up here in, in uh, Massachusetts. It's been working its way down. Around 1990, it made it to North Carolina. And a, a couple of things, the factors were, were just right and they were able to get a control on it so that we only have two counties that are infested and that would be Currituck and part of Dare. And since then, uh, this area, well, the, the whole state is trapped. We use these traps here. They have a pheromone in it that attracts the male. He thinks that there's a female to mate with. Uh, attracts them in and then there's sticky, sticky uh, stuff on the walls there. They, they get stuck to it and we can find out if they're there and how many are there and if there's a, a building population and all. Uh, this area right here along the border, uh, we, we have a lot of traps out. As you get farther away, there's not quite as many, but when, when a reproducing population is found in an area, the, uh, the, the, a, a control method is put out and I'll talk about it in a minute and we try to push it back. It's, it's easier for us than uh, the, these jagged lines all the way around here. You know, you, you can't keep it from going into that county or, or this area right here. But a straight line is a little bit easier to defend. They do come across the line. We do get them in the traps. And then, uh, then they are beat back with, the, uh, with, with some of the treatments that the Department of Agriculture puts on. So, uh, so the prevention of those, again, the firewood thing. Uh, keep your hardwoods as healthy as possible. You know, get, get a good management plan and, and uh, whether it, it's the trees in your yard, get them healthy. If you've got forest trees that are full of hardwoods, get a good management plan and keep your trees healthy. If, when, if and when Gypsy Moth decides to make a, make a run on North Carolina, the healthier our hardwoods are, the, the better chance they're going to have of surviving. There are foliar sprays you can use. Uh, there, there are some biocontrols, um, fungal and bacterial. That, that are used um, to, to keep them keep keep them together. It's not something that a landowner would, would no normally use, but would be broadcast over the uh, landscape. And, and they both both the uh, fungus and the uh, the bacteria are specific to this uh, to this caterpillar. Well, the fungus is um, the, um, the the sex disruptors. Uh, like I said earlier, they we we do lure those traps with a pheromone, the, the, the smell that the, uh, the female gives off to say that she's ready to mate. Well, that's been reproduced. It's been put into a foam or a gel and that's sprayed over an area. And so it's a mating disruptor in that uh, the, the, the male goes flying along trying to find a female and he can't find her because he's, he's going down all these dead road, you know, dead end roads, uh, goes over here, can't find a female, goes over here, can't find a female because the smell is everywhere. Um, uh, earlier speaker Kelly was talking about uh, some of the cruel things that insects do. Well, the cruel things we do to insects is just bad sometimes. So, but it's it's, it's one way we can try to keep them under control. Um, if what 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 you could do with them now is is uh, there's no need to to collect these. If you get a good picture, that would be great. I had someone send me a picture last week. Uh, I should have known just because of the time of year the the larva weren't here. Um, it, but anyway, she sent me a picture. I was able to tell her what, what the picture was of. Uh, these, you can send it to uh, the new pest uh, also, but just, just send the picture, let them know where it was and everything, and uh, uh, they'll have somebody go out and take a look at it. Mm -hmm. So, so any, any questions on uh, Gypsy well, Moth? Uh, yeah, so the, first of all, that we have one viewer team that he said that he grew up in, with Gypsy Moths in New Jersey and sometimes they will drop out on the trees uh, from the trees uh, on their head and actually that they used to paint this sticky goo around the girth of their hardwood trees to cut the gypsy moth off. Uh, oh, yeah, actually, actually I forgot about that control. Yeah, you could put a burlap band around the uh, 
uh, around the, the, the trunk of the tree at about eye level and do that in the fall. You can put the sticky stuff underneath it or you could just put that band there. And when they come down later on, the female comes down, she prefers to uh, uh, put the egg in a place where it, it, it's hidden. So if she can go down the tree and just put, put it up underneath that, then you just lift the, uh, lift the curtain and, and just scrape off all the egg masses. Uh, I've seen that happen also. Or you could put the sticky band on there because they, they do come down uh, at, at times when, you know, the, the, the sun is shining bright and there's a lot of uh, predators around. They will come down and hide during the day and then go back up and feed during the night. But when they start getting big, they, they don't come down anymore. They, they, they just want to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they 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 will fall on you. They, it has scared scared more than a few people. They'll call up. Where are these things falling on me? Yeah. So and I forgot to ask you a question from from before. Uh, it's a question from Melody. You talk about the high value trees. What do you mean with that? Is like economic value, aesthetic value? Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, high high value trees. Sometimes you can't. You can't treat every tree in the forest. And dealing with people with trees in their yard, you can't always treat every tree in your yard. You know, it's just, it, it takes time, it takes money, it takes labor. So your higher value trees are trees that have economic value or they have landscape value. In other words, it's the perfect tree in the perfect spot. And if, if that tree was gone, it would be missed. Uh, it could have historic value. Uh, you know, George Washington slept under this tree. It could have sentimental value. Uh, grandpa proposed to grandma underneath that tree or whatever. Whatever, whatever value system you have, there are certain trees that you, you get attached to. And so if you, if you had to do triage uh, to, on, on, and decide which trees you're going to, you're going to uh, try to protect, you're going to try to protect the ones that have the highest value to you. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm gonna move on to another one. I think this is the most interesting because my, my background, I, I have more of a uh, pathology background and this, this one has a patho uh, pathology component to it. Uh, Red Bay Ambrosia Beetle came in, it got past the customs inspector at the Port of Savannah in 2002. It was not a pest like some of the others, not a pest in its native country. Uh, it got here and uh, it targets anything in the laurel family. And so the laurel family includes red bay, swamp bay, they're down, listed on the bottom, pond berry, pond spice, uh, spice bush, sassafras, and uh, unfortunately avocado. So these, uh, the, uh, anything in the, uh, the, the laurel family is suspect. Uh, they, uh, the, the, the way they operate, the adult red bay ambrosia beetle will bore into the wood of a, of, of a host and because it's an ambrosia beetle, ambrosia beetles are, are special because they're fungus farmers. They, uh, they, they, will, they have a, a special mouth part, or it, some of them have them different other places on the body, but this one has a, a, a special thing in their mouth called a, a mycangia, where they, they carry spores from a fungus, the fungus that they prefer. Different ambrosia beetles like different fungus. But the one that they prefer, they carry that with them. When they bore into the tree, they don't eat the wood, but rather they plant spores, and then they eat the uh, they they eat the, the 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 fungus as they go along. Um, and then so fungus the tree gets the, uh, the the tree realizes it's being attacked by an invader, and it clogs its pores to keep the fungus from spreading. And it does such a good job that water can't get up the tree and the tree will die very quickly. You'll see this, uh, this browning or wilting of the tree and it will do that very quickly in a matter of weeks. And it looks like I need to speed up just a little bit, so I, I will, but, so, but anyway, what you go look, what, what it is, is, it's a very small insect. It's about the size of Lincoln's nose on a penny. Uh, it does have that mycangia, like it says. Uh, like I said, it does carry a fungus and the fungus the disease that's caused by that fungus is called laurel wilt for obvious reasons. It goes out the laurels and it wilts them. So what we're gonna look for is we're gonna look for the wilting trees. We're gonna look for very small exit holes. So they're, they're gonna be tiny, probably a little bit bigger than the O on the back of the penny where it says United States of America. And, and sometimes 
uh, you'll see these little toothpicks or noodles sticking out of a tree. And that's where they, have with their saliva and their frass and the sawdust, they're pushing the sawdust out. And so if it hasn't rained or if it's not windy, these little toothpicks will come out. And, uh, and, and you'll see them on. If you, then if you take an ax or a uh, machete and you peel the bark, you're gonna find brown or, or black, uh, dark, dark streaking. That's, that's the tree, that's not, that's not the disease actually, that's the tree plugging the, uh, the, the, the plumbing system of the tree to keep it from, from moving. It's kind of like putting a tourniquet around your neck. The tree kills itself trying to keep the, uh, uh, the disease from moving from one place to another. So it was found in, in uh, Savannah, it went south, it went a little bit slower going north, it got down to the uh, avocado section of South Florida in the 2012, about the same time it got to uh, North Carolina, and it's now found in about 11 counties in North Carolina. And uh, the, the bay, bay trees usually grow along the coastal plain, mostly in this area right here. So we still have a little bit, it goes up to about Norfolk and then, then peters out. But you'll see over here, there's uh, this, bays do not grow in this area. These are areas where, uh, where, where the tree is, where the, the beetle has carried its fungus and infected the, uh, uh, the, the sassafras trees. And sassafras, sassafras goes all up the east, all the way up into Canada. Uh, two counties here, the uh, Wayne and uh, well, Wade, Wade and Bladen and uh, I think Lenore all have uh, we we have found it in Sassafras and, and also Sampson County. Uh, so it's in eleven counties in North Carolina, and uh, we're you know we're just hoping it doesn't get into the Sassafras. You know, Sassafras is another special tree. It has value to people because it has cultural history. Also, people like the tea. It has medicinal value. Native Americans use it for, for certain purposes. Uh, so uh, it, it does have certain other values. Oh, by the way, that word right there, harassafras, that's my word. I made it up this morning. That means uh, harassment of sassafras. So uh, anyway, we're, we're not going to move firewood. Uh, we're not going to move any woody materials associated with. We ask loggers, you know, if you Cut a bay tree while you're cutting everything else. Just leave it on the ground, leave it there. Don't take it with you. Uh, forgot to mention there's a nerd alert here. I, I do like Star Wars, so I've got a couple Star Wars things in here. Um, anyway, don't move the woody materials. My counterpart down in South Carolina uh, said when it, when it first got to the Charleston area of South Carolina, that somebody cut a tree down in their yard. They cut it up, threw it in the back of the pickup truck, drove over to the, the dump on the other side of the county, the landfill. And a month later, all the bay trees along both sides of the road from that house to the, the landfill were dead because the, the beetles were, were coming out of the, the firewood at the time and it infested all those trees and also infested all the trees around the, uh, the landfill. There are no controls. Uh, even sometimes the, you put an insecticide on the tree, the, the beetle might go up and bite, take a bite of the tree and realize, oh, this doesn't taste good and leave a spore behind. So it, we're, we're still grasping with trying to find a way to control that and we don't know of any biologicals. Um, so this one is not a regulated pest. And so you can, you, you can still send it to new pests and they'll send it to us or you can get a hold of your county ranger and I, I have a web page at the end or website at the end you could go to. You can send it to your county ranger, you can send it to me, you can send it to uh, the, the new pest thing and they'll get it to us. Uh, but good pictures, collect it if you can, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look. And then I got one more, the uh, emerald ash borer. And if, if I was on the earlier one, uh, this was one that was talked about. It come over from um, probably mostly China and Russia. Uh, entered the United States probably early 1900s. It wasn't found though until about 2002 in Michigan. Uh, it, it does attack all species of ash that grow in the United States, including four in North Carolina. So in North Carolina, we have white ash, green ash, Carolina ash, and pumpkin ash. It also attacks fringe tree, although it may not be as lethal to fringe tree as some of the others. It might kill a branch or, or something like that, but fringe tree is actually the ash trees and, and fringe tree are both in the, uh, in the olive family. And so they are 
they're pretty closely related. And so it has, but ash trees are, are, are what are really affected by this. So the emerald ash borer will, will, will go into the, will bore into the tree. It doesn't go into the wood right away, but rather will uh, uh, get, gets underneath the bark and it eats the tissue right below the bark, between the bark and the cambium that, that moves the, water, the, the food down from the leaves to other parts of the trees, including the roots. So it eats that area and now the, the food that the, the leaves are producing can't get down to the roots. The roots die and now the water can't get back up the top of the tree. So uh, usually it takes a couple years for symptoms to show up for that, that whole thing to play out. But once the tree, the roots start dying, the tree dies very quickly within a couple of years. So uh, it's, this, is a, this is a real scary one. We're gonna lose a, a lot of ash on this one. Um, we're going to look for the, the metallic green boring beetle. It's about a half inch long. You can see it there on a penny. Uh, it's a metallic green, real pretty. That's a, like a reddish purple underneath the, the wing, if you lift the wings up. Uh, the grubs are, where was, where was the grub? Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. They're about an inch and a half long. When they're, they're older, they're cream colored. And, uh, oh, there they are, right up there. Uh, they, they're also, each segment is bell-shaped and they have a brown, uh, oh, they're cream, oh, yeah, they're cream colored. So they, what you're going to look for, you're going to look for uh, ash trees that are declining or dead. You're going to look for the D-shaped exit holes, whereas the other one we showed earlier, it was round. This one's D-shaped and the D may be shaped in any direction. It may look like a D or a backwards D or an upside down D, but it's always D-shaped because that's the shape of the animal. Uh, you'll see vertical splits where the tree's calloused over an early, uh, an early infestation. And you'll see these squiggly galleries or tunnels underneath the bark where the, the larvae have fed on the, on the, the phloem, that, that tissue that moves the, uh, the food. You'll see lots of sprouting coming off the tree. Uh, that's the tree's uh, defense trying to, perpet trying to stay alive. And you'll also see this, this activity where the, the uh, Woodpeckers and, uh, and other animals have come along and pushed the, the bark off, trying to find the, the beetles underneath the bark. This is where it's been found so far. Uh, we, it, the, all these red counties right here, it's now in 60 counties. It was first found in 2012 in uh, 2013 in, uh, in, in Granville County. Uh, we were trying. We're trying to track it by grids and, and fill in these grids. We know that it's it's pretty much all over the place. We just haven't gotten reports of those areas. Uh, again, we're we're going to try to minimize the movement of firewood. Uh, there are in forests. It, there's there's just there, there's not a control that we have yet. There there are some biocontrols that are, be, that are being put out. It doesn't do any good for a landowner to put out the biocontrols. Because you know the, the parasitoid wasps and others, uh, they could, you could pay you know for for a bunch of these things and they'll all fly off your property and you'll never see them again. You never put these things on a tree that you're trying to save. You put them in the forest to save the next generation after the wave goes through. Uh, there's chemical controls that are available. Uh, some of the same ones that we use for hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, and so it, it's worthwhile for the for the high value trees again. To, to try to save them, but it's uh, the, the the really good chemical, the one that really uh, it's 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 called a imibectin benzoate. Uh, the, it, it's costly; it costs about ten dollars an inch in diameter of the tree. So a tree that big, that big is going to cost you you know a uh, hundred dollars to treat because it's got to be injected like these guys are doing right here. I feel in this case. Report it to the local county ranger. You can you, again. You can you can report this to the the, the new pest uh, website, and they'll uh, and they'll let us know. But this is one that it's regulated, but the entire state's in the quarantine, so it's uh, it, it, uh, we'll we'll take care of it if you give us a call. Uh, I can't say that enough. To uh, don't move firewood. Uh, here's an uh, address right here for. Uh, contacting the county ranger, your, your person in the county you live in, uh, they can come out and take a look. They can give you recommendations on what to do on, on, in your area. Uh, the new pest again is right here. And if you're in doubt, just report it. Report it to me, report it to new pest, report it to county ranger, report it to any of us. 
we'll make sure the right person gets it. Um, and so that's that's what I have today. And uh, there's my contact information if you have any qu uh, other questions after we're done today. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Braxton. How, how harmful are emerald ash borers to trees? Oh, that's a good question. They, they, uh, they will, they're tree killers. And not only are they, uh, they, they're lethal to the trees. We don't have any tree, we don't have, we, there may be some trees out there that, that are resistant, but we haven't had it here long enough to tell. But if you look up here in, in this picture right here, this is a, uh, uh, a street in Toledo. And it was planted with ash on both sides. Ash kind of has that vase or face shaped, uh, V shaped crown. And it, it's nice for planting along roads because you get that tunnel or cathedral effect. Well, in 2006, this is what it looked like. And this is what it looked like in 2009 after emerald ash borer came in and killed all the trees. When it gets into a stand, every tree will die. Mm -hmm. there, may be a, there may be a couple trees around that are resistant, but it doesn't spare any trees. It, it moves right on through. Okay, so we don't have more time. So again, thank you, Rob. This was amazing. Actually, answering the question on, on the chat, yes, it is a lot of information that we want, that we need to rewatch again. So again, this program is being recorded and is going to be available at backfest.org. So before wrapping up, we want to, of course, thank you, uh, Rob, for this amazing presentation. So we are very glad that you could be with us today. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And of course, uh, we haven't finished Backfest. We have another day. So uh, if you want to check our program, please go to backfest.org. If you want um, a souvenir from this uh, Backfest, go to uh, backfest.org to get one of the t-shirts or you can get one for free if you join or renew your membership. Uh, good news, the museum is going to open again on Tuesday. So we are very excited to see you again. And till the next program, have a wonderful Backfest week. Bye-bye everybody.